um, hello and uh, welcome to Passing on Passmore podcast number five. Uh, so we'll do the audio description first. So, uh, and also my name is, so I'm Joe Willis. I work with Shalal. Um, I am nearly 60. I've got silver hair, I've got blue purple glasses, a pink scarf, maroon jacket, and I'm in front of sort of white and would um, always forget what to call this. What do you call that? I don't know. Um, background. I'll call it a background for now. Screen. Okay. <laughs> <That's> green. <laughs> well, nice screen. And I'm very, very excited because I said, that the, so the first one, I haven't told Mary this, the first podcast was um, Passing on Passmore was with my brother. And so, oh. so this is with Mary Finn, who I actually do remember knowing as a baby. So that makes me really old and her really young, which is really exciting. <laughs> so she's just going to give you a little audio description now. Hello, I'm Mary Finn, calling in from Greece. Um, I'm 25. I've recently shaved all my hair off, so I'm pretty much bald. <laughs> uh, and sitting in a pretty plain white room. Um, that's about it for me, really. Super, super. Thank you, Mary. Oh, so welcome. So we've mentioned briefly the, the, um, the question. So the first question, so you've said that you're in Greece and so what inspires you what have you done you might want to put those in different interweave them in different ways so combine them together yeah um lots of things really I think the first thing that inspired me and led me into the work that I'm doing today was the sort of world of photojournalism and um I studied photojournalism for a year and I was inspired by a lot of um, documentary photographers and war photographers that went into really complex um, conflict zones, humanitarian crises, places all over the world where there was human suffering and actually documented what was going on there. And I learned a lot about the influence that videography and photography can have in sort of changing public per perceptions, but also um, changing policy and uh, things on quite high levels and sort of thought, well, maybe that's a good way to make a change. And I don't think really that my inspiration or my, my focus at that point was like, I want to make a big change in the world, but I was like, wow, I'm interested in combining this sort of creative practice with something that's useful. And I think I've always had that yearning to just do something useful and something that sort of makes sense in the world. Um, so they were many yeah, photographers were my first inspiration and that led me to come to Greece for the first time in um, 2016. And I came to do a, a photojournalism project for my university and um, saw the chaos here in Lesbos as many thousands of people were crossing the water um, to come to the island. It was really an exodus of people in 2016 and um, yeah, mostly sort of Syrians and, and Middle Easterns um, fleeing their countries for a safer um, and more secure place to live in Europe. And um, it was a real moment of like perception change and perspective on A, how difficult it is to be a, a photojournalist in that kind of setting. Um, and B, that there's actually a whole world of what was called, what is called humanitarian aid and something that I had never really considered as a sort of path that I could take and I think that my yearning was to like do something useful and help but um, I didn't realize that there were sort of other ways to do that or I didn't consider these other ways so photojournalism really inspired me and led me here I left that behind for many reasons because I, I didn't see myself following that path but I, I got wrapped up in this world of humanitarianism and I think what really um, drew me in was the people um, and I think I can strongly say that along this journey, it's definitely been the people that I've met that are out here or, or anywhere in our communities all over the world, doing something good for someone else or for our planet. And those people are like nine times out of 10, extremely motivated, extremely passionate, extremely open and loving and friendly. And like the kind of groups of people that you just feel totally comfortable around straight away and I found myself as a part of that community and felt really welcomed I felt like I, I belonged somewhere and I I felt like I was doing something good along with these people so it gave me a lot of power and motivation and and I think that that inspiration those people and have you know definitely helped me to to 
move through this, um, the process of the things that I've done and develop and learn how to do things in the most appropriate way, in the most effective way. Um, but also to realize that, you know, I come from a very privileged background being white, British from a family where, you know, I had food on the table every evening and I didn't have to think about my education and like everything was handed to me on a plate. And I, I think that I never really realized that until properly, until I was faced with some of the, the situations I was faced with and to be able to be surrounded by other people, maybe from similar backgrounds that are like, we have the privilege uh, that you know that we've been born with but it doesn't mean that we have to be stuck in the echo chamber of people that are born into to privileged backgrounds and end up becoming landowners and um and just you know causing all sorts of um environmental economical problems in the world and causing a lot of damage we can do something different and we can do something different together and it's brought together people from all different walks of life and um i think uh, yeah just uh, it's also a personal thing of it so it feels really good to help other people and um i think that that drew me in and that yeah encouraged me to do more and more so yeah definitely the people in the community that is has inspired me a lot and along with that like uh following a lot of other activists um across a lot of different disciplines that have done amazing work um and that become kind of yeah like inspirational leaders of our movements um so those people for sure and what i'm doing i, I started out working um in search and rescue here in greece working on small uh NGO, uh, non-government organization rescue boats that were rescuing people crossing the sea between Turkey and Greece. Um, and from there, I went on to work in other boats that were working in the central Mediterranean. So between the sort of Italian uh, coast and North Africa um, and in other, other places in uh, the Greek mainland working with like small grassroots projects um, providing like education and psychosocial support to people living in the camps. And now I'm back in Greece again after doing some, being back in the UK for a while and doing some studying. And I'm here at a project called Sporos Institute, uh, which is also working with the refugee community here on Lesbos. And we are um, living on a permaculture farm and applying the permaculture principles to uh, this space and running it as a permaculture project and inviting people from the camp to come here and learn about permaculture and to implement it in the place in which they live at the moment. So I'm running a space called the Eco Hub, which is like a small community garden just opposite the camp. And people come there every day. It's, it's busy, it's really busy. There's a lot of people coming and it's a lovely space where people can come and just hang out in the garden and have a bit of peace and quiet or come and really learn like how to grow things or how to um, make herbal medicines or we run all sorts of different workshops. So um, it's a really inspiring place and uh, very empowering for the people that are stuck in, in very dire situations in the camps here. So it's really exciting and it's just my second week. So I'm really fresh here, but I'm, it's got a lot of potential, this project and my a new passion for permaculture which is a, a, a sort of new path that I've started to discover has also um, really inspired me to think about how uh, we can yeah how we can make this world a better place on a kind of environmental and a human level for everybody and to join forces and come together as communities yeah. quite a long answer sorry about oh, that. no it's brilliant it's pretty <laughs> So lovely because I was reading out the, about the Bigger Than Us film and one of the things in it, it was saying about being useful and that's what Parson Edwards said about being useful and you were saying that and the other thing was um, I had this lovely conversation with a friend Jamie Moran talking about a third way communalism between the left and the mm. right really and that was all about people and community and like you were saying the things that motivate you were that sense of it is wonderful isn't it when you meet those open-hearted loving people and you find a community where you feel like you can be effective and people are valued and, and change can happen. That's yeah. an, an amazing, um, 
amazing privilege and a wonderful thing really to find that in life, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's and I think that we've we've lost that sense of community in the West. We've really lost our connection to working together in groups and being effective and efficient in groups and also supporting each other in groups. Yes. And, um, you know, in other places in the world, that's just not the case. I was speaking to a guy from Afghanistan here that was like, you're all like trying to build community, but we come from places where like, that's just a given. You grow up like knowing hundreds of people in your local community that like, if you need help, they'll just help you. Like, there's no question about that. It just is like that. If someone's not got something to eat, they'll just give you food. And it's like, wow, we've we've really moved so far away from that in the West. And we've we're learning. We're like relearning how to live together. And that's it, it makes me quite sad in many ways, but it's also like, OK, I know what we've got to do here for our communities. And and also we can learn a lot from people that are on the move coming from other parts of the world where that's something that they've, you know, that they've been a part of for a long time because they know how to yes. help each other out and, and live together like that. And that's real wealth, isn't it? I think, you know, actually mm -hmm. sort of having that sort of loving, supporting community is real wealth. It's not about that things. Is real wealth, yeah. and, and sort of you know looking good or whatever is it um so then so then I, I, there were so many things i could talk to you about for ages but then that question is um and i do want to just say you're in the bigger than us film which is fantastic and i do want to ask you at some point i really want to get that scene over here more but um yeah that's not a conversation be good with it but um i'm just going to plug it in here um <laughs> and then so what would you do if you had, you know, the so obviously permaculture is a new love or so it's an extension, isn't it? Because it's all, it's all part of it, isn't it? It's us seeing ourselves as part of the ecosystem, I feel nowadays. It's like not just studying things that are outside us, but actually we're all part of it. But what would you do at this moment now if you could really affect some change, either by having a lot of money or a lot of influence or whatever it is, or a lot of energy behind it, what do you think would be your thing for this time now? It's just such a hard question. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I drew it in my head, like, oh my God, I would do this, I would do that. No, like, on well, you can give me like, a running you list, you know, you could have like, you could have a wish list. I think I should have really thought about another question. I'm not sure that that was a really no. good question to throw at people, but no, but it, do what it's you like with it. it like that yeah because yeah, it's something you. that on this grassroots level we we can't think of because we're all always like scraping the barrel for a bit of fundraising and actually like imagine what power mm. we would have if we like had big monies uh, or big influence sadly yeah. these are the things or if you like, know if you could affect things. that if, if government would take us policy say for example you know yeah. talked to someone the other day you know we could rewild half of britain and still yeah. be able to eat yeah. You know, so yeah. so would that be something that you would go like, yeah, well, let's be wild half of Britain or um, yeah. you know, where, where do you think the real obviously it's sort of lack of community? Um, we've got mm. our bio, so, so my brother talked about biodiversity and localism and um, mm -hmm. maintaining species. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, it, it, and for some people, it's more like we have a sort of a, a, an impulse but we don't quite know where it goes but I reckon you will have thought about it quite a lot because you're hands-on so you would have thought about what yeah. can I do you know it's an interesting one I'm a very hands-on person and I've worked in a lot of projects that are very much like there's a need and we're going to fill it and we're going to do it and we're going to be here on the ground and actually do it um which is a, is a great response and I've seen a lot of like just amazing people you know as, as I've said just just doing it because there's a need and that's great we need more of that so that's like something that can always be encouraged but there's also a need for like the other end of the scale for people being tactical and strategical about how we can fight policy change because for me it's like something I've been thinking about a bit more recently um, because I met a very inspiring activist in France who has managed to get um, uh, deep sea fishing banned at a European level mm -hmm. and I was chatting to her about it like how on earth did you do that and they were a team of three when they did it really small team not much experience not, well, barely any experience working really hard to be fair but like no money nothing and she said just a good strategy and a very creative lawyer yes. and actually <laughs> it's interesting when it comes down to these things the laws are very easy to pick apart if you know what you're doing and to find the gaps in it where you can take them down. And she had, they had scientists on board as well. And I think science is a really good way of, of tackling these issues because they're respected at that level. And I think that 
the activists and the movements and the grassroots are, and are doing great work in a in a practical and physical way amongst in the communities but they're not respected at that level so a part of me feels like okay going for that like high level policy change in something could be really really effective if you had a team of people that were like really specialized with scientists and lawyers and and human rights activists that sort of all came together all those like bright sparks yeah. and those great minds and um there's a lot of very inspiring people out there that have great alternatives to, yes. to the mess that we're in. And we need, you know, Donut Economics is a great example of that. And um, I've been reading a book recently by Yanis Varoufakis, who is a, a Greek um, politician who's got some amazing ideas about economics. And yes. uh, there's some, yeah, just a, a lot of inspiring people out there. So how could we bring these people together to like think of a solution and to then like try to fight the people that have the power? Um, and especially in migration, I mean, my field is migration, so I think a lot about how it could work on that level. And across Europe, across the world, actually, they're, they're, they're causing human rights violations, violations of the law. You know, just yesterday, um, the High Court in the UK ruled uh, the law that's passed through for people to be sent to Rwanda as legal. And like, this is, this is like, so unbelievable as if these people have never read the Geneva Conventions you know it's like they have no perception of of, of humanity and and that is something that you know that I would love to be able to influence on that level to be like actually no that we're not going to let that happen and we're going to take you down and mm. um so that's one thing and I, I I think like yeah dreaming big I would love to have a huge movement and a big team fighting these kind of injustices in migration on a big European level a very coordinated response so, and going for policy yes um do, do you think so if there was a sort of wish thing if you had that sort of team do you think we could make sort of safe pathways because it's safe migration routes because I was talking exactly. to someone the other day and they were saying you know by I don't know in 20 or 30 years time we might have a billion displaced people on this planet because of various crises or whatever whether it's war or famine or whatever so how do we in a way that would be that thing is that how can we start now thinking about safe yeah. routes what are the ways yeah. that people can travel safely between countries how can we exchange yeah. populations how can we support each other in that neighborly sense rather than this horrendous isn't it horrendous I, yeah. even, I can't even begin to talk about it actually yeah. that's why I want to try and talk about the other things because I no, of course, I see that, that those sort of pathways would be good it, it's like you almost have them on, on an environmental level as well for animals you know to have sort of yeah. corridors where people where animals can move safely yeah and so corridors yeah. safe corridors for people or something safe corridors for people safe passage is you know something that a lot of people have been fighting for for a long time but it's just it's just not something that's favorable for Europe who is controlling its borders they're totally controlling its borders and they let the people in that they want to let in and the others they they leave to die at the borders so it's it's a lot of things I mean people are fleeing for a lot of reasons so it's difficult to kind of um give yeah an answer that covers all of those people but for a start connecting people with um communities and countries where they can be distributed like the amount of people that have fled to europe now and that are in europe now from other places is is just minimal if you distribute them properly i mean they're highly condensed in certain areas that are struggling a lot with the influx and that's totally understandable so there needs to be a way for them to be properly distributed and that takes a coordinated response that takes like all of the countries saying okay we're going to manage this together and we're going to manage it in this way like in an effective way that's cost effective as well and i think a lot of the the inspiring grassroots projects have been from communities saying like well we've got space we've got mm, an empty yes. house here we've got an empty this that uh, there. we can support the people um and and inviting them in like um Falmouth and Penryn Welcomes have, yeah. are a great example of that and they've great, welcomed they? families it by going to the council and saying we'll support them and that won't cost you anything and they're like oh okay then sure we'll do that so how can we encourage people it's it's about getting in on a on a community level and saying like you know how can we encourage people to to be welcoming and we saw that with the ukrainians you know people were suddenly extremely welcoming when it was european um 
uh, refugees. And I think that with the right information, people can be like that with all people. And uh, something really interesting that I learned about recently with the Ukrainian response is um, the GEN community. So uh, Global Eco Village Network is a oh, sort yes. of network of global eco villages around the world. And it's a really growing network of, of people sort of living on land and living in communities. And um, they opened up uh, a section of their of their organization called the Green Road. And the Green Road was where uh, various different gen eco villages, uh, I think around Ukraine or Eastern, different places in Eastern Europe, basically opened their doors and said like, we can house this many refugees in our communities and then once they housed them for a while you know either for a while or some places permanently they taught them permaculture and these kind of resilient um practices that they could then move on and, and take with them to be a little bit more resilient in the next place but also like it, it sort of open them up to this network of like there are eco villages all over the world so you might not be able to say in this one but like you're connected now, you're part of this group and this network. And I think that was really inspiring to think about how we can create networks of yes. communities that support people. And it shouldn't just fall on, on the communities that are you know, living in this way, but, but everybody to be kind of, to have that welcoming attitude. And that comes with a change of attitude of who these people are. Like it just is as simple as that. And, and at the moment, the government and the media are controlling the perceptions of who these people are. And so it's got to, that's got to change before we can bring people with safe passage to different places because they, if they're not gonna be welcomed in those places, then there's no point bringing them safely, safely there. And at the moment, you know, a lot of the British public want to send people to Rwanda because they don't understand the, the situation that these people are in they don't understand or, you know or they believe that the things that they're being told by the media which is really sad to see that um and then and then yeah creating safe links between these things so for example like with the uh, gen eco villages it was like okay so somebody could be in a, in a war zone and they like find online this eco village that will take them so they can go directly there and I think you could make amazing networks between, um, you know, somebody that's in a refugee camp in Jordan and an eco village in Scotland. And they're like, OK, we're going to connect these people and we'll fly them there. And there's funding to fly them and settle them. And, da, da, da. and then it's a whole process and it's, it's a long process. And there's a lot involved in, in resettling people. But we have to find a way that makes yes. sense because yes. otherwise it's going to be at absolute chaos at European borders as if it's not already it's going to be so much worse and sadly um, they're you know they're not thinking in that sort of long-term way because they actually the governments don't want to think about that they will do everything they can to sort of repel and keep the people away so um, yeah we need to sort of lead with example on that and then, and, and, then, and then fight on this policy level. So I think what's really important in terms of fighting with, uh, with policy is to make sure that you're coming in with an alternative and you're offering a, mm. a, a different way. And um, I think quite often there's a lot of backlash from activists, but not a solution. And we've got to change our attitude to a solutions-based approach because otherwise we'll never be listened to. Um, and yeah, that takes a lot of great thinkers to come together and be like, OK, if we were in control of Europe's borders and the Europe migration system and right at that EU level, how would we rewrite right the, the, the way that things are being done now? Um, and that's, yeah, so it's a very complicated thing to do. But there are people that, that are in the, the right position with the right minds and the right hearts to do that. And yeah, those are the people that should be doing it, not the ones I know, that are there. I, I agree. I, th I think it, it, it's that whole idea of remodeling, isn't it? And have, and coming up with new solutions, or at least uh, that urge to find that new solution. Because I'm like, you know, you, we don't have it immediately, do we? But that sort of working towards it, I think, is 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 crucial. Um, and I used to get very yeah. frustrated sometimes listening to programmes, and you'd go like, there's somebody from a university, and they've got really good analysis. And you're thinking, why aren't they making the decisions? You know, it's like sometimes yeah. you get a good analyst, but you haven't got a good solution. So no. it's somehow putting that emphasis on, on problem solving, isn't it? And 
um, yeah. remodeling. I thought that idea is, yes, just making new models. So if you can connect people and you can fly yeah. them, then you're not bringing them yeah. to land, you haven't got the borders problems, you just get them in and then have a welcoming. Um, I was talking to a friend the other day, there's something called Circle of Supports, which mm. is used in different ways, which is when you have somebody who's vulnerable, it might be somebody who's leaving prison or it might be somebody with a learning disability, they choose people they feel can really support them and they invite them into this circle of support because I think sometimes that and that's why those um, welcoming refugee groups are so brilliant because you have like 20 or 30 people surrounding one yeah. family if it's only yeah. a few people people get scared they think I won't be able to do it I'll burn out so yeah. you need a big impetus don't you, you need a bigger group holding things yeah yeah, yeah. 100% yeah exactly that's why a community living in community is more resilient because yeah. you've got each other to, to to work with and on our own we're, we're so useless we're not designed to be on our own. It's I think that's so interesting isn't it and, and that is one of those sort of myths of our time and I definitely remember it was around when I was younger oh you need to be a complete whole person and I just just go yeah. like no I think we can be quite broken actually and just yeah. admit that we're <laughs> broken and get some help true yeah and you don't need to have all the skills and all the knowledge and all that you can have one little bit that you can add to the yeah. community and you might be a mess for the rest of it you might be really disorganized and really this and really that and whatever but somebody else will be really good at that so you'll be fine you just give what you've got and then the rest is is fine and it's so important to remember that because we're not I really am scared for the future for the future and I think a lot of young people are and I think that um we've got to come together mm. and we've got to come together with a positive forward thinking attitude. And I think a lot of the coordinated response has been very like doom and gloom of like, you yes. know, all of these really scary statistics and, you know, very, a very angry attitude towards the governments, which is totally fair enough. And the mm. statistics are real. So we've got, to, we've got to know them and listen to them. But, um, we we need to be positive and motivated and um and a solutions based approach is is really the best way so uh, yeah i think that's that's something that we need to remember as, as a group of young people especially to yes. work towards that because i think you only need to see there's a, there's a saying called the terror of the situation, which I used to look at sometimes and go like, oh, I think that's appropriate in life and then put it back in its bag. But the terror of the situation, you only need to really glimpse it. You don't need to look at it really hard unless you've got a lot of strength and you've got a lot of ability to make that work for you. You really just need that as an impetus to go forward to do something good, positive, beautiful, affirming whatever it's no good is it if we just sit there feeling we don't want that it's very easy to feel powerless and I think yeah. I'm really impressed by young people that people aren't sort of accepting feeling powerless and are motivating and I feel I suppose I feel as an older generation I really need to you know do something because I'm part of the mess I'm part of the problem you know I wish I wasn't but I am um and mm -hmm. so therefore we have to everybody has to do something really yeah, hundred percent for sure. And it's it's yeah, it's also about working intergenerationally. I think a lot of people talk about the young generation and stuff, but it's we can't pass the responsibility on to the younger generation. And say, oh, it's their problem now, but they're they're doing a great job, you know, like of fighting this. And it's just that's just not the way at all. It's really that like yeah people you know as many people in this world that have spent you know years studying very very specific topics but that like one little bit of research that they've done could be revolutionary in in coming up with something new a new solution it's like a it's like a piece of the puzzle that we're going to need and and people with different skills and, and all of that so it, yeah it, it's, it's also about starting a global conversation and things like this like just talking about it over and over again and having as many conversations as possible is something where for yourself you know and for others you can start to have these ideas and thoughts and information about these um the things that are happening in our world sort of present in your life and it's very easy to shut yourself off from that and i i, I know that like either from sort of deciding like I'm, I've got to be away from this I don't want to see it or from just yeah kind of blind ignorance like just not not caring and we we can't afford to have loads of people that that don't care and and 
don't don't feel it. It's it's so much about feeling um, the feeling other people's suffering and the suffering of our earth. And I I feel very confused about people that don't are not able to feel that. But it's it stems from the disconnection and yes. the di disconnection with nature, but the disconnection with each other as well. And those two things I think are a, such an important step. That's another thing I'd put my money towards for yes. sure is like connecting people back to the earth and back to each other and um, bringing people out of this like individualism and out of this kind of like little um, plastic box that they've created for themselves of like, yeah, of parallel reality. And actually the reality is like, this is soil and this soil is actually supporting your, your life. <laughs> yes, yes, Touch it, so Touch it and see how you feel for a bit and yes. yeah, and be in this group. But yeah, there's so much we can do to just connect with nature. And, and that's a first step to changing perceptions and to, and to understanding and all of that. So it, it's, there's a lot of work to be done on all sectors on a kind of like intellectual level but also on a really spiritual level and on an environmental level there's so much but they all like are interconnected and I think that's really important and like recognizing that these things need to be attacked from many different angles yes. to be able to have a sort of coordinated response to what's happening. I thought I thought well, well, I I really agree with you. The interconnectedness is so important, and it was very interesting when I was talking to um, uh, Oliver, who who was in Extinction Rebellion. He was saying, you know, they're hitting the government sort of bang on. They're confronting the government bang on. But he said, but the the break won't happen there. You know, the the little chink will be somewhere else. But you still have to keep going. It's almost like sort of weakening it or something. You have to keep going. And like you were saying, with that one person with that special knowledge, you don't really know where it's going to come from. But we have to keep yeah. the communication, keep the interconnectedness and keep going. So that eventually something breaks through, isn't it? You just have to yeah. sort of keep moving. And I'm, yeah, and yeah, no, I think it's it's hugely important at this time. And it's it's very easy to sort of just hide one's head and not look. And I think we just have yeah. to look. We have to look around yeah. us and we have to, um, so my brother was talking about just, you know, being in a quiet enough space to see patterns in nature and to see behavior. Yeah. And, yeah. and Oliver was talking about, you know, what pushed him into Extinction Rebellion was noticing that the swifts were getting less. So the thing he was waiting for that he loved every year was seeing the swifts return and there were less of them. Yeah. And he was suddenly going, oh my goodness, yeah. you know, what's happening? Yeah. Something that I absolutely love that intrinsically we're part of exactly and and feeling that feeling of of something that is quite uh that's that's a lot bigger than you you that sort of that sense that you have inside of you that's like oh wow this feels just amazing and i think um uh, that, that thing of like standing in a circle, for example, I think there's a circle is a very important shape and we've, yeah, that's a part of our disconnection, but um, it's, it's that thing of standing in a circle with people, with other people and like doing something, having some sort of like shared space and just the feeling of standing just in a circle with other people, either in silence or not, or holding hands or not, or whatever it is, is so powerful and we need to like, recognize like there's that this is really powerful like this this um the things around us the people the, the connections that we can have without even having to say anything or do anything or whatever and it is about noticing it's about observing how we are inside our internal being and also um what's happening around us and i think we've lost touch with looking and observing and and being um aware of of what's happening around us with the people and and the place that we're in um and yeah so much can be noticed when you actually look even in a small space you sort of you know if you look at the same bit of garden for yes. in yes. permaculture you do a lot of observing so it's like okay look at this like tiny bit of garden you're like surely there's nothing else to see <laughs> and then you start to see like just so tiny tiny little things going on and then you start to think about all the things that you can't see that are going on that you know you'd have to put under a microscope to see and your mind's just suddenly blown over this like tiny bit of soil about that big with a few yes, plants yeah. in it and it's it's like wow this uh, yes yeah, it's, it's that wonder of the world that we need to be reminded of to be able to care about it enough to do something to fix it and um 
that's yeah that's something that uh especially our generation with technology and and you know high density population in cities where there's like no green at all is like these people have not no, have not grown up knowing that connection and if we're not careful we'll lose it and we're actually the, I read some really interesting science about the way in which our brains are actually devolving some of the um, uh, instincts that we are born with as a result of not being connected to nature and that was terrifying for me it was like wow if if we have just two or three more generations that are devolving in this way yes. we're going to completely lose the, these instincts and we don't realize how important they are it's like a, we don't need the instincts to be able to you know understand this very niche thing in nature because i'm i'm living in london and it's not relevant but it's it's absolutely intrinsic in in who we are and how we interact with the world and we have to connect with that again to do something about about issues that we face today for sure yeah you're just cracking up a little bit so i'm just going to wait because it's i think it's just oh there we are it's coming back um that might be better. It's so important that, well, in, in my work, we always work in circles uh, and we listen to each other and we have rules yeah. as well, what how we speak and, and being positive and supportive. Um, mm -hmm. All those things are really important, aren't they? I've got quite a lot of friends who, who really are very strong on you need to be barefoot, you know, you need to be <laughs> on the earth. And I, I definitely love that myself. So, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it, it is fascinating. And I think I think also I just I think I do come back to architecture a lot because I just think you know there's a lot you can do even in high rise even in urban areas you know with gorilla <laughs> gardening with sort of hanging plants there's, there mm -hmm. is a lot we can do you know we could make our environment so much greener so much friendlier I mean one of my other things as well is I just don't understand nowadays I mean ornamental trees are very pretty but I really think we should just be planting fruit trees and sort yeah. of plants that you can eat we've got a bit of a forest garden at home just things sure. that you can forage and eat you know yeah. the just... parks should be full of them and people should know what they are or there yeah. should be information about like you can pick this and yes. boil it and eat it and it's delicious and yeah. that's that yeah and it would save us so much money and it would be so much more joyful and yeah you know and and I, I'm always quite impressed I, I some friends I had in Russia, you know, although they might be very sophisticated, they all go out to their dachas in the summer and they pick the fruit and they, you know, mm. they gather mushrooms and they bring it all back. They haven't or they hadn't lost that connection to the land. And my yeah. parents had it a bit, you know, and I think that a lot of cultures still have that connection, but it's seen yeah. as advanced not to, which is ridiculous, isn't it? I, I think yeah. that's changing. Yeah, I think so, slowly, but not everywhere. And yeah, not enough, not enough to, to you know, we've got so far to go to for people to realize how important the connection is and then make the next step of being like, oh, it's it's in a really bad state. And then the next step of, oh, I need to do something. And that, that's a process, it takes, it takes a while. And, uh, you know, my situation was very much like, just fell into a, a crazy situation and ended up rolling with it. But um, for a lot of people, it's a process of like starting to hear about these things. Like with Bigger Than Us, the film, I've done a lot of screenings and spoken to a lot of people um, in question and answers and interviews and different things. And a lot of people come up to me and they're like, oh, I just, I just know that I need to do something. I, I just like, I keep hearing this. I keep hearing about these problems and what's happening in the world. And I, I just have to do something, but I don't know where to start. And it's right. the classic question. I don't know where to start. I don't know how to do something. And I think education is a big part of that. You know, we should be teaching the, the next generation how to do something that is like absolutely key but there also just needs to be a lot of there's a lot of conversation about these issues but there needs to be a lot more of how we can how we can have a, a response to it and do something good um mm. and i think that's really important because i think do people do feel like really 
uh, challenged by by suffering from 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 hearing about these things and not being able to do something and that's a horrible feeling because and we all know what that feels like to be like mm. ah I'm hurting as a result of knowing about these things and not being able to help and I think that yeah like the moment you do do something to help you feel so empowered so joyful that thing of yeah like like you said going mushroom picking together mm. even like mm. finding even finding the community that wants to do that is like a big step where do I find these people where are they so I think connecting people and over this common like um desire to do something could you could end up finding a lot of people sort of in the woodworks that like they're desperate to do something but they just don't know where to start and and we are powerful collectively with big numbers you know it, we've seen that through the responses of of organizations like XR where it's had a really powerful effect in in a short time with a lot of people um so I, I do think that that's a, a big thing as well and something that also you know needs money and and shouting yeah. lots of yeah you know like shouting from the rooftops about come over here we need people and we need a collective response I think so and, and I think there's sort of new models of of behavior and of communication and of hierarchies and structures I think because I think mm. quite often people think like well we have to have a leader and then we have to delegate and then we have to have this and, that. Yeah. and, and a lot of the things that are successful nowadays are much more collaborative and cooperative yeah. than that and so I think it's also teaching people that you know you you can have a degree of autonomy in what you do as well as well as being in a supportive group and I'm just talking out loud now so it's just quite interesting yeah there we go and then because this is so lovely and this is like an ongoing conversation could go on for the rest of, well we'll go on for the rest of our lives hopefully because I, it's been a real pleasure yeah to actually talking there you know, we were talking, and someone said something. Someone said very, something very nice about the podcast. He said it's like listening to a really nice di dinner conversation. But you know, quite often you don't have time to really go into it. But Mary, you're right there. Yeah. Right. So what yeah, yeah, I say to you. people as well is, is there anything else you want to say? Is there another comment? Is you know, sometimes when I was talking about it, you're like, oh, so I just want to say this. Is there anything else you feel like one last sort of thought? gosh it's hard to know where to start I feel yeah or where to finish I mean there's just so much to say in there. I think um one thing of like my year and what I've learned and I sort of try to think a bit about you know, my my life and my year and reflection I think it's really important we don't spend enough time kind of thinking about how we're doing or what we're doing or what how we're, why we're doing it so all of those things and I think a really good reflection for me for this year has been that I've really immersed myself in a lot of learning and podcasts have been a huge part of that. I've been really immersing myself in listening to these great thinkers and great speakers and great people that we have in our world that now have these platforms where they can speak for hours and hours and hours to us um, for completely free. And it's it's really opened my eyes to... Um, the interconnectedness of the issues that we face and I've definitely I've worked in migration for years and I found myself being very tunnel vision with it and being like this is you know I'm fighting this and this is what, how I'm going to do things and actually to be more open-minded and have more influence from different topics and understand the world in different ways has been really beneficial to, to doing the work that I do now. I mean, now I'm incorporating permaculture with, with the, this migration issue that I'm fighting. And I think it's a beautiful marriage of, of, uh, of a concept with a problem that is like, yeah, the solution meets the problem there, but it comes from something that is not necessarily migration related. It's like something that sort of, of you know supporting the environmental issues that we face today but it, it applies to migration and it applies to um many of the other issues in our world in, in our world and i think that um that that kind of like awakening of like wow if i delve into these other topics i can find more new creative ways to to tackle these things and fight these issues um so i would like just uh, yeah encourage people to to really 
find people that are inspiring for them and follow them we, we have you know social media can be a blessing and a curse but i think that um there's more of a move these days for these kind of formats of like podcasts and and long uh yeah long reads and stuff like that and um listen to a podcast today actually where he was talking about uh, you know the death of television and that people are more interested in listening to long conversations about something that they're passionate about. And that's great. That means that people are more engaged and more um, interested in yeah, diving into a topic and knowing more about it. So uh, yeah, that feels inspiring. And I think it's really changed my perception of, um, uh, yeah, uh, of the fact that we can learn every day. And that's great. You don't need to go to university to learn about a topic. There's loads of information there to grab and that's such a beautiful resource um and that is revolutionary and that can change our world by lots of people starting to wake up it's like the seedlings after the after the winter they start to just push through and and rise above the soil and grow and it's that moment of like once you know about something you can start to like understand the world on a different level and then you can take action and you but you can only take action when you've kind of done the the groundwork first laying dormant in the soil of like really um getting to grips with something and um that's been yeah that's been so important for me this year so uh, yeah i would like to say that that's important well, that's really and something to the philanthropists out there too invest in <laughs> education <laughs> of our youth <laughs> yes yes so no, totally and and just different skills isn't it that there are different skills we need for life it's not just passing exams you know no so no non-formal education all the way <laughs> all the way through well my mother even right. years ago she was saying oh people just need to be educated for the rest of their lives you need to be able to access education but i think like you're saying that there's something very lovely about that universal generosity, isn't it, of information that is out there now. And although it's not yeah. always easy to find it, one thing will lead to another. So if you find one that works for you, then it quite often recommends something else, doesn't it? And so, exactly. yeah. um, you know, I, I'm going to ask you to send me lots of links so I can put them at the bottom of this um, when it's on YouTube. You know, yeah, so, I was like, like, yeah. so people can go and go like, oh, that was interesting. I'd like to read up about that you know yeah yeah and it's sharing that is so much a, a, of this is sharing of like you know I know about this and you know about that or, or you know I'm gonna share with you what I've learned from my experience but also from like what I've heard and listened to and learned through yeah all these amazing people and platforms that we have that are sharing their, their information for sure brilliant thank you darling <laughs> thanks joe keep oh, up the great work so you're a part of that you see you're sharing these these amazing people on your podcast and um i'm really excited to listen to the others and uh yeah keep it up it's oh thank you doing. darling well it's so nice to hear from you and, and we must be in touch more and well done congratulations for all you're doing thank you i always feel like i want to thank people who are out there being active you know because it's like I, i'm so active in my way here but it's like we're all part of it, isn't it? So it's like I'm very grateful for the people who are doing much more hands-on. So thank you.